Brüdor Podcast. Welcome back to the Blue Door Podcast, brought to you by O2 Business. I'm Danny Hicks, your host for Season 1, in a series where we discuss technology and people with senior leaders from some of the world's leading organisations. This week, we're taking a look at the workplace of the future. I'll be talking with Chris Early, the Estates and Development Manager at Telefonic UK, about how the need for officers and the role they play might evolve over the coming years. And we'll be talking with O2's Head of Digital Solutions, Ant Morse, about the role that innovation needs to play in keeping businesses and brands relevant in the future. So open that door, come on in, and let's begin. So for this week's episode, I'd like to start with Ant Morse, Head of Digital at O2. We met up online to talk about innovation and in particular, how critical innovation is to cut through the noise as everyone looks to digital to connect with their customers, with their employees, to buy, to sell, just to make things happen. So hi, Ant, and welcome to the podcast. Look, first question, head of digital, what does that actually mean? Sure. It's a good question, Danny, and, and there's two parts to it. So the first part is it's around leading the digital solutions team. So we have experts in a whole range of fields from connectivity, workplace, security, data insights, Internet of Things. And it's around you know helping our customers understand and our wider business understand how those technologies work and what they can actually do. The, the second part is, I guess, the cool part, which is around looking at innovation. It's around keeping an eye constantly on the future. There's no crystal ball, but we know we make it our job to be ahead of trends and new innovations that are coming through. So that's that's the bit that is really interesting. Fantastic. Now, a, a pretty easy follow up question, actually, with digital being so broad and so diverse. How do you actually keep up with what's happening out there in, in the market, what customers are up to, what sort of innovations are coming down the line? Sure, absolutely. And that is a good question because um, there's no college course, there's no degree or, <laughs> uh, or school class for this topic. I think my, my history is is in digital and 26 years in the organisation. And uh, I guess I'm fortunate that I'm quite interested in, in digital innovation. I make it my job to keep up to speed on a number of different technologies with particular interest in the world of IoT, the world of VR, AR and XR technologies as well. And really then it's around you know, great innovation is fantastic, but it's completely useless unless we can put it to good use. Is yeah. it going to make our lives better? Is it going to improve our day? Is it going to uh, help us service our customers in a better way? If it doesn't meet any of those criteria, you know, it's good to know, but, you know, my interest in it fades. I'm interested in what will help us live a better life, work smarter. No, really good point. I guess if you had a digital eight ball, your life would be a lot easier, I guess. So would a lot of other people's. But knowing what technology can actually have an impact on businesses, that's one of the things that you and I have, have talked about in the past. And I'm just really curious, how do you look at different technologies and determine, I can see the, the potential there, or I can see how A plus B can actually give you something that really works well? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's that's the test of, you know, to the point I make around, you know, is this going to uh, help? For me, every technology should be assessed to see where it is going to solve a problem. And that might not be a problem we know about today. That may be that it's, an, you know, something that's going to help resolve something that we didn't know was a problem. Perhaps we didn't know we needed the mobile phone until it was invented. Perhaps we didn't realise that, you know, wearable devices such as fitness trackers were useful until they came onto the market. So for me, it's you know, again, to that point of innovation is fantastic, but what is it going to do? How is it going to help our day? And if we look at particular innovations in the business sphere, then, you know, it's about what do they actually do? Do they make a worker more efficient? And if so, how and why and what's the return? You know, everything has to be tracked to that return on investment, not just a financial investment, but actually, you know, is it worth an organization looking at this? We're probably the biggest critic of digital technologies as well as the biggest fan and biggest supporter we try and sit on both sides of the fence when we evaluate any solution and that makes plenty of sense knowing what works isn't always what's obvious as well 
I mean, 2020 has thrown so much at different people and the way that they've been working has probably dramatically changed from even 18 months ago. How do you think people should be reviewing the sort of digital solutions that they brought in? And here I'm talking about things like unified comms or collaborative working or digital means to engage a customer base when retail stores were closed. How do you actually take that step back and go, okay, what do I do now? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point and, and very topical at the moment for me personally. If we think about the last eight months of the pandemic, we've, we've changed the way we live and work. Through that consumerization of IT, we as, as end users, and, and that's everybody, working in a different way, where also our expectations are changing as well. So we want to be serviced in a different way. If we ring our bank, we want, you know, why, why are we calling for a start off? You know, why can't we do more things online? What do applications look like? You know, how do we progress? And this is the, the challenge for everybody, business owners and leaders, is how do we progress the communications and interaction with our customers using digital technology, meeting the societal trends that we've experienced on the back of the pandemic? You know, we're, we're sat in our home environments now. We're, we're super efficient. You know, there isn't, there isn't a spare minute in the day because we don't have the travel. We don't have that. But we also don't have the time to pick up the phone and ring the bank. Yeah. So yeah, it, and that's a great example of they need to, you know, businesses need to evolve across every industry to understand what is that societal trend and how do we react to it? Because, you know, the pandemic tested the systems, but it can't be an excuse for not evolving either. So, you know, it is quite a challenging point, but I think we wouldn't be adding the value to our customers if we didn't put those challenges statements out there. So, well, how are we going to change? So, you know, yes, it's about deploying secure remote working it's about making sure our people have access to the right kit that you know they're observing uh, the dse and, and taking good care of themselves but actually that's the obvious things the next stage is how is that societal change going to change the way that i now ring my bank or how i want to be serviced and interact with a supplier and and again you know it's not just a pandemic these trends have been happening quietly in the background yeah. for many years pandemic accelerated it you know digitalization transformation exponential growth of technologies has always been there what we've done is we've just pushed the fast forward button uh, danny on a, on, a, on a number of these things. <laughs> and i guess Ant, there's actually quite a few priorities that probably have shifted so now that we are embracing a, a digital world and we have this flexibility and where we're able to work because the systems are being introduced and those sort of things. I guess there's almost a reliance on our employers or the products and services that we're taking to consider maybe the impact that's having on our lives. Like you said, you know, we, we barely have a spare minute these days. How do you think digital can actually also look at not necessarily the psychology, but the ways of helping or, or keeping staff sane, you know, free from Zoom fatigue and those sort of things. Absolutely. There's, there's two parts to this for me, Danny. The first one is we need to take some steps ourselves um, at a management level and business leaders need to, you know, be, be the chair and the sponsor for the new normal. You know, how do we take breaks, whether it's a, a no call Wednesday or a video free Thursday, whatever that looks like, you know, we need to observe the, the impacts that that's had. And I think that's an easy one, but it's one that's crept up on us. You know, we sit in our chair for a very long time. Actually, let's work a little different. And I think that's it's it's an obvious one, but a bit overlooked, I think, sometimes. But it's something we can easily we can easily interact with and, and fix. The other part has got to be around how technology can and will evolve to embrace this. As with any change in any industry, in any timeline, There'll always be innovation to capitalise on, you know, a changing environment and new opportunities. And for me, we're going to see more artificial intelligence solutions gradually, again, quietly appear that will start to take some of the day job away from us. And, and it sounds a little future thinking and a little bit off the wall, but I think there are already digital applications that can predict responses to emails, can predict steps in a project or a project plan. And it's how we actually embrace those things to say, how are these going to make us more efficient? And it's not about robots and machines taking our jobs. It's actually consider the emails you receive in a day. 
how many of those do you need to actually reply to? How many are just for your information? But yet when you get to the end of the day, there's a you know large inbox. For me, you know, digital technology will evolve to start to pick up some of those. Or maybe actually it frees up 30 minutes and an AI assistant reads those emails that are of relevance and you can quickly respond by voice. So I think that, you know, we need to take some steps to work more efficient now. But I think watch this space on technology progressing to actually take away some of the uh, some of the headache. Good stuff. And I guess talking about technology that's progressing, I wouldn't be, or this wouldn't be an O2 podcast if I didn't ask you about what your thoughts on 5G and that impact to what we might be seeing in the future would look like. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, 5G is um, is very exciting. And I think 5G is going to delight in some areas and it's going to disappoint in some areas. I think if we are looking at 5G to change the way we live and work and live on our mobile phones at a consumer level today it's probably going to not you know I'm, I'm still looking for what's the hero solution what's the hero product speeding up our devices we'll take that all day i think that's absolutely important but i don't see a, an enormous change you know 4g is a fantastic speed network you know it gives me everything i need media music all those good things video calling you know it's great experience sharpening that brilliant I'll, I'll take that all day long but but actually i think where the true innovation is going to come is going to be from 5g in the business community 5g private networks and advanced innovation and solutions such as digital twin virtual reality augmented reality the mass scale of internet of things devices working together and, and together is is probably the bit that needs the progression the interoperability of some of these solutions working together but for me that's where we'll start to see some amazing innovation and in turn that will then cascade into the uh, into the consumer channel but this for me will be probably one of the first times in my career that i've actually seen a business application accelerate consumerization generally it's the other way around consumerization of it then kind of feeds slowly into the business sphere and we embrace it this i think will be the opposite fantastic no thanks ant a bit of an entry into a world that's still being built around us this new technology is definitely going to have some pros and cons and i, I tell you what in a, a few weeks we're going to run some extracts from the panel that you put together around industries and evolution in a country and change I think there where we talked about some retail experiences as well as utilities and financial services, it'll be great to have you come back and and maybe elaborate on some of those thoughts if that's okay. Absolutely, yeah, I'd be thrilled to. Brilliant. And, And I guess the last obvious question to you is how can customers who are starting to think about the pros and the cons and what all these aspects of new technology are going to look like. I mean, you're always open for a virtual coffee or a knock on the door and a bit of a chat. What's the best way to get in touch with you, Ant? Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, we're really keen to uh, to expand this conversation. You know, this this innovation isn't there isn't a roadmap for it. There's no uh, there's no path or map as to how we can get there. So, you know, those virtual coffees for me are, are, are really important. We're learning heaps and, you know, and hopefully we're adding a, a, a lot of value to help us, you know, businesses understand what might be the innovation, what might it do for our organisation, for our customers and for society in general. And we bring experts to those. We have a coffee. You know, there's really great conversations. And, and to reach out to me, contact me on LinkedIn, drop me a note. And yeah, we'd love to, we'd love to engage. That's great. One, one thing I will say to anybody who is looking to drop a message to Ant across Twitter or LinkedIn to start up those conversations, do make sure you put some time frames around it because I know Ant and I have been speaking to the wee early hours some mornings around what can be and what is coming just over that horizon. But look, Ant, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it and looking forward to catching up with you in the future and bringing you back onto the podcast. Yeah, likewise. Thanks. Uh, good to speak again, Danny, and looks forward to speaking again soon. So some really interesting takeaways from that, especially around the need to innovate to meet new customer expectations as a result of societal changes we've all witnessed over the last year. So one of the areas I think where innovation is going to be needed in the short term is around what to do with our existing office spaces. You know, we're at a point where we have to start thinking about a hybrid workforce. The fact is, we've seen that working remotely away from an office 
does work. You can actually trust people to do the jobs that they're asked to do, even if you can't see them in that office. So people are going to be working from home, they'll be working from offices, they might be working from coffee shops, pretty much wherever they need to be able to work to get done what they need to get done. So when businesses are planning to accommodate people no matter where they're working, we need to ensure that there's still an ability or a level of collaboration. We need to be able to enable the business to move forward, even whilst times are still a little cloudy. So with that in mind, I'd like to welcome Chris Early to the podcast. Chris is Telefonica UK's Estates and Development Manager, and he's an expert at creating workspaces that enable and motivate people to do the jobs they've been hired to do. And as an estates manager, he has to start thinking about how we can make sure that people, no matter where they are, can actually come together. So Chris has been in this field for, Chris, how long now? Well, I've been with Telefonica for quite a few years. I originally joined as part of the networks team doing cell site acquisition design construction back in the early 2000s, November 2001, actually. And I've been, cut a long story short, been through all sorts of different roles in the company. And after getting involved in setting up the network share with Vodafone in 2008-9, came back to take up a role in the mainstream property team. And now I'm looking after anything from acquiring buildings, negotiating terms, getting contracts in place, consent to alter space, designing and fitting out space, moving people in, moving people around and making changes during the lifetime of a building once we've got it in the portfolio. And a bit of facilities management as well these days at the back end, as well as supporting some of our group companies like a Telefonica group in the UK, Wira. Gift Gaff and Tesco Mobile. So yeah, quite a jack of all trades. If you were being, if you're being unkind, you might say these days. Fantastic. Well, welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thank you very much. I think looking at the way things have, have transpired over the last 12, 18 months with everything that happened in 2020, what are the key things that your job is now asking you to start looking at? I think the first thing I'm going to admit here is I've got, a, um, I suppose, a, a guilty secret here, um, which is that <laughs> I've actually quite enjoyed 2020. And that sounds and, and obviously in a lot of ways I haven't because, you know, it's been a really difficult year and I'm not I'm not recognising that it hasn't been a difficult year for everyone. But from a work point of view, it's been really engaging. It's been very challenging. We've had, had to be very fleet of foot as all organisations have, but we've really been able to sort of pull together a team as a team, draw on our experiences and make some change, make some further change and build on what we'd already done. And also go out and about and have all of these conversations. People have been much more open to knowledge sharing this year, which is, I think, has been really interesting. So I've, I've found that there have been some serious silver linings, actually, unexpectedly from this year. To be honest, I'm a bit of a hermit myself. And the fact <laughs> of the matter is, when I look at productivity and efficiencies across the board, I think there's been some huge benefits not sitting in traffic for an hour and a half to two hours per day just to get to an office to do what you might be able to do from other locations. And I know that O2 is really important embraced that flexible working for depending what stage of life you might be in and I guess this forced removal from collective areas where people used to come to work is something that we're now really starting to think how is that going to impact us long term and I know that we have invested in real estate we have buildings we have leases for stores for example all those sort of things what are the, the, the major elements that you think we need to start thinking about for the workforce over the next three years or so? I guess the first thing to say here is that um, without blowing our own trumpet too much, we've been working as an organisation, as you all know, in a, in a hybrid way for many, many years. And that's certainly not to say we've got everything right, not at all. But it, it does give us a slightly different perspective when coming to these kind of conversations. And we're a little bit maybe further down the road, I suppose, than some other organisations that have maybe had to rush from a one person, one desk policy in the, in the most extreme situation to a complete remote policy temporarily this year over the next three years in terms of what we're doing i think our journey and, and evolving what we have in the portfolio further improving the performance and efficiency of the space we've got note that having having a bit less space and continuing down the, the journey of trimming space where we can 
looking at better ways to monitor the performance of that space. So obviously you and I and the teams talk a lot about IoT and the future of IoT and the benefits there. And we've done a quite a bit in property over the last 12 months, um, piloting some um, equipment with our Total FM partner, ISS, in um, one of the floors of our Bath Road campus, looking at things like CO2, temperature. So, you know, the condition of the environment, but also utilization via some, some more advanced um, ceiling mounted point grab sensors, which pick up heads and shoulders so we can see in real time what's going on. So I think some of that stuff I'm really fixated about demand management at the moment. This is a massive yeah. thing, which I don't think anyone, a lot of people claim they've cracked and, and they, I haven't seen anyone who's fully cracked it. I think um, we've tried things in the past this year, partly because of COVID, we rolled out a system working with our internal IT team called The Lab, which is a great innovative team, very proactive guys who jumped on this problem with us during COVID and developed a, an app that we could run over any browser where people could, once we'd worked out the socially distanced capacity of the offices site by site and produced all the plans, then produced a system where people could verify and go in and book access to a building for any particular day. So that's been great this year to fix a problem, but also we, we continually having conversations with them about how we might adapt that and whether it's part of the solution longer term. But yeah, there are lots of solutions out there. There's a danger of jumping in and panic buying, I think, if you're if you're completely new to this market. And obviously yeah. a lot of people are looking for things. But you've got to think about the behavioral side. And what a lot of these systems don't do is uh, it, they treat it as a free resource. So the problem is when people have got a license to book space for, say, three months ahead freely, then a lot of people will just do that. And that, of course, can frustrate other users because it appears that space is fully occupied when it's not. And then yeah. you can find yourself hanging around to see when, when the booking system is going to drop out the, the desks that haven't been um, haven't been occupied on that day. So, yeah, this um, and it's not to say things haven't moved on. And we're in conversations with a lot of companies and some people are doing some really interesting things. But I, I'm looking for that step change, really, that takes into account the behaviours. We've done things over the last 12, 18 months with how we manage the space physically. So ensuring it's uh, standardized and clean and the signage is correct to encourage sharing. So ensuring people have got the, the right environment, the right facilities and ensuring the ground rules are right as well and communicating those. So making sure that people know how it should be working and, and how they you know, should be playing fair with each other. That's great insight. And I think as we start to look at the adoption of, of digital solutions like collaborative tool sets, unified comms providing things like how we're talking today, completely remote, but connected and, and with, with pretty good audio. How do you see your role needing to consider those different ways? I'll just give you an example. There was a group of us that actually came into the office but we realized that there were too many of us to, with the social distancing uh, rules in place, that we couldn't actually all assemble in a particular meeting room. And even though we were in the office, we ended up just running a session across teams where we could use mm. a, a shared desktop. And then we were thinking, why the heck did we come in? It was nice to see each other, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know? But those sort of aspects... Do you see it becoming more of a hybridized world? How do you think it's going to influence the way that you use that traditional space that was set up for someone to sit, whether a permanent desk or a hot desk? But how do you see those changes impacting the way that we might operate our own uh, real estate plans? It is tricky. And actually, that that problem that you describe Although, you know, it sounds like a COVID problem. I'm familiar with that pre-COVID, you know, in, yes. the, in, in the buildings, because, as I said, we have been working in such a hybrid way. Now, one of the things we've increasingly noticed is there's some more difficulties cropping up around acoustics when people are sitting at desks because people are maybe on longer Teams calls. And, and that could be sometimes because teams are spread across, you know, the north and south of the country. We've got two big office sites in the north of the country. So, you know, those challenges are there already. It's partly making sure you've got, um, well, coming back to the utilisation point, I think meeting room as well and desk utilisation is important. You know, it's important that people aren't booking up rooms and not using them. Or, as well, you know, we often do uh, third party utilisation studies, which are 
great and really comprehensive work with a company called Baker Stewart. Gives you a whole raft of information. One of the things those often show you is that meeting rooms are all booked out. You know, you and the guys, if, if there weren't social distancing rules in place, there might have been 10 of you looking for a room for 10 people, can't find one. Actually, do the study and you find that a lot of the time there are two or three people bouncing around in a 10 person room so that's where the the utilization and the behaviors and the ground rules really becomes very very important and then you know there'll be times when that's still not the fix and it frankly it's down to using the right headset so we've been working a lot with teams in the bigger locations looking at the type of headset trialing different types of headsets not just where the acoustics for the speakers are correct, but obviously the microphone, because it's no good just cancelling out noise from around if people at the end of the call can can hear people sitting next to you. Teams rooms as well. You know, we've been big advocates for Microsoft Teams. That's yeah. been one of the big successes, which I think really underpinned uh, our position going into COVID, wasn't it? And Teams. Yeah, uh, to, to, to be honest, I, I couldn't believe the timing of rolling out Teams. And then... Mm. <laughs> it's uncanny. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was part of your master plan, but it actually worked really well for adoption. Teams is great and um, Workplace as well, which is in effect Facebook for work, yeah. for those who aren't familiar with it. But we had Yammer before, but Yammer never really clicked in the same way. And uh, Workplace has, has worked really, really well. But Teams rooms, and a Teams room is basically just a room that you're setting up with a higher grade of, of uh, video equipment, audio equipment, and just getting the surrounding set up better so that when someone's at the other end whether on their own in a room or maybe in another meeting room in another, another part of the country or indeed another country that they feel more interconnected with that meeting and then you, it'll all, all gel together but again hybrid is difficult you know and that's why a lot of people are uncomfortable here not least the landlords of course but you know the old model one person one desk you know very problematic in all sorts of ways but much easier to plan for initially the more you go down this road, the trickier it gets, you know, and there are some trade-offs. There are some great tools out there. There are some different ways to approach this where you can definitely smooth the path. Yeah, look, I, I think it's a great point in terms of the affordability of some of these sort of solutions that you're talking about with Teams or Rooms set up to run Teams sessions, allowing for, for you know, joining groups of people a, a, across the country. We used to have the collaboration suites, the Cisco collaboration suites that were very optimized, but quite expensive in contrast to some of the solutions that are out there today, right? That's right. Telepresence. We still have some telepresence rooms and there are, they do perform a role, particularly with um, with the board and some of the high level calls and interactions between, say, the board and, um, and our parent company. So there's a time and a place for those, but we are revisiting the number of them. And as you said, that although they're very high quality environments, and if if you haven't used one before, it's, it's worth using it. It's 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 a it's a novel solution. The way you you're made to feel through the, partly through the way the room's furnished that you're actually sitting at one half of the same table. So I think it's great. It's great, but but a little bit limiting. And actually, for a lot of the calls, a lot of the meetings we're having now, people don't need a telepresence room. But what they might need for a longer session is 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 a Teams room or something akin to that. Look, I, I think you're right. That accessibility of technology these days for how we need to begin investing to do work in a slightly different way, whether it be location or, or, or instead of coming together in person, we're geographically distributed, is going to continue, I guess, getting made a little bit easier, especially as Look, Chris, I'll be honest, I tried to buy a, an updated webcam for my laptop integrated camera. And mm. within the first couple of months, that camera that should have been 99 quid was selling for 400, 500 pounds. I mean, opportunistic and, and those sort of things. But I guess as, as everything starts to settle down, a lot of organizations are going to be reflecting on when they should be bringing people back into the office whether they can continue to work in, in the same sort of manner that they have remotely because it seems to be working. But I think you touched on a really important point earlier, which was essentially around some of the psychology, some of the, the people factors where you can look at numbers on a page and make some assumptions. But the way that people think and the way they need to interact with people – how do you think that needs to play a part in what people are going to decide moving forward? 
Well, people are in an essential part of it and we can't forget it. And obviously, you, you know, you and I work for a business which has the customer at the centre of everything it does. But we also, in, in a similar vein, we also put people at the centre of everything we do. And that's why a lot of us have been here a long while, because it's a, a great place to work and it's a great community. So people will definitely be a, a massive part of that. In, in the debate, um, which is ongoing, particularly on LinkedIn <laughs> these days, is a fascinating debate, sometimes a bit too partisan about return to, to the office or, yeah. or as I, I really don't like it being called return to work. You know, some people are going from one extreme to the other saying everyone's going to be forced back to the office or everyone's going to work from home and get rid of all the offices. But it is about the people. If you've got to look at what people are being asked to do as part of their daily role jokingly had had a conversation with someone senior who shall remain nameless recently where they were saying a bit off bit off the cuff oh we can get rid of all the desks now and I said look <laughs> I'm going to argue the opposite of what I always argue now I'm going to argue for the desk you know because I said look tell me about you know think about what your your staff and your teams are doing day to day what are the tasks that they're having to undertake for you how are they undertaking what sort of tools are they using if they're using a lot of data what size of screen it's a if they're having to do that, what are they having to do? And if you analyze it, a lot of that, for, for good or ill, is still PC-based, and hence it's still desk-based. Whether you want to call it a desk or not, you've then got a question about where that desk needs to be, and indeed, do they always need to sit at the same one? And maybe some of the time they're doing a report or whatever, and they're comfortable sitting at home if they've got a suitable setup and uh, the kids aren't screaming, <laughs> um, and they can get that done. Or maybe in another time, they want to come in and they've got to spend a morning doing something or do a couple of hours on, on, on the PC doing a couple of Teams calls and then they've got to jump into a face-to-face -face meeting so it makes sense to be in the office. But I think it's accommodating that, being being realistic, I suppose, in grounding. Don't get carried away. You know, It's always anchored in what the people need to make sure they can carry out their, their jobs and not be frustrated and um, give, give them the choice. But with choice comes responsibility. So, of course, we've all coming back to what I said earlier about utilization, we've all got to, you know, play fair and we've got to have a, a common set of ground rules to deal with the, the shared use of that space. That's great. Look, Chris, I, I, I just go back to every time I used to drive into the Slough office at the boom gates, the security gates, there was always that sticker that said, do you really need to be here? <laughs> yes. And, and for a lot of people who we, I mean, a number of tours I've done over the years and, uh, and you know, probably it's people are less surprised these days, but people were often quite surprised by this approach and the yeah. fact that people were coming and going during the day. So even a few years ago, maybe going back, say, five or six years, I would probably, when I was planning out my week, I might think, oh, you know, Monday, I'm getting some stuff done at home. Tuesday, I'm maybe going to see some, you know, one of our suppliers. Wednesday, I need to go to Slough because I need to catch up with, you know, A, B and C, and we maybe got a face-to-face -face meeting. And the way I used to plan it is I used to think, well, I'm going to Slough, therefore, I get up early, get around the M25, etc try and miss the traffic which is what i like to do but then i used to stay there for the whole day because i used to think well i'm here that's what i do i'm in the office yeah and then eventually it got to the point i think one day i thought well actually i've done all this stuff i had to do it's one o'clock i'm just going to miss the traffic get back and then plug in again at home and get on with it and that's what i tend to do now and some people when you explain that to them and you show them around they're they're still a little bit surprised I think it comes back to your point before where it's all down to individuals. We, we actually, as people, can make good decisions. And avoiding the traffic to actually give yourself a half hour back of productivity that you might be able to do at home should actually be something that can be considered without feeling guilty, without feeling, oh my gosh, my boss can't see me, so they're going to assume I'm not doing my job. You know, if we do move that sort of, of KPI to what are you actually delivering, it shouldn't actually matter where people work from. No, exactly. I know, you know, as I said, we're, we're quite fortunate, flexible working or, or hybrid is now called, which I think is a better term, because when you think about flexible working, people often get confused with the split between, say, part time and full time. But exactly. Yeah. Hi hybrid's been pushed by by our board for many years. And, and that's given people that confidence to go and, and make that kind of decision. You know, we've got clear objectives. We're managed by those. So, you know, it's quite obvious if we're you know, delivering against our objectives or not. But, you know, it's good to have that support. And as you say, it's not only good for the individual. I think sometimes you can gain half an hour 
uh, you're mentally in a better state you can you, know, you can work in the most productive times and uh, and achieve a lot more hopefully exactly without hitting that horn 15 times on the way mm. home you're usually a little <laughs> bit calmer <laughs> Look, Chris, really appreciate your time today. I'd love to bring you back in a couple of weeks when we start to look at new technologies that we're bringing across different industries. And I know you'll be involved in a roundtable session in uh, the coming weeks as well. And it'd be great to get maybe a, a bit of a summary from you in regard to some of the experts that we have sitting around that table. But for today, thank you so much again. No, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for again for asking me on. Great to have you on and we'll talk soon. Cheers, Danny. I think you'd agree that our workspaces are ripe for innovation. And I think Chris's point about involving people is key. Giving your people choice while recognising that with choice comes responsibility. And how about changing those KPIs to focus on what is delivered rather than on where it is delivered? It should all be about the efficiencies and productivity that can be delivered through people's different stages of life. What they need to do, when they need to do it, is going to shift. Responsibilities aren't just always focused on work, but they can be evenly distributed. And you can make the most effective use of time when time is actually on your side. So give that back to the employee. So with that, that's about it for this week. And I really do hope that you hit that subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you prefer to listen to your podcasts on, as next week we'll be focusing on diversity and inclusivity, trust and reputation, all very interlinked and intertwined. We'll be listening in on a recent panel discussion that considers the corporate responsibility of every organisation to not only be fair and trustworthy, but to also support the communities they serve and are a part of. So until then, have a good week and see you next time.